In today's episode, we have Hans C. Nelson. Most of you have probably seen Hans on Farzad's channel and in other aspects discussing Tesla and Tesla stock. In today's episode, I want to get to know Hans and who the man is behind all of the brilliant insights that he has brought to us here in the Tesla community. In today's episode, we will learn about Hans. We'll also get his take on Tesla. We'll also unpack his way of thinking and why he sees the world in such a beautiful way. Hans has a unique background. He spent a lot of time living outside of the United States. He grew up for a good part of his time in Africa. And this experience has created a unique perspective on how he interprets the world. Hans is also a mechanical engineer by degree, which allows him and I to have more of a commonality in the way we think. Today, we scratch the surface on who Hans is, and we obviously take that back to talk about Tesla, but it also allows us to explore a first principle way of thinking through the lens of Hans. We will probably do more episodes as we dive deeper into who Hans is and his view and how he takes on the world from a unique perspective. He's a man who has really invested in understanding history to better understand what the future will look like. I appreciate Hans joining me on this episode. I look forward to future episodes with Hans. With that said, do me a favor, follow Hans. You can find him on Twitter on Hans C. Nelson. And he also has a YouTube channel also under the name of Hans Nelson. Please go take a look at his content, follow him on Twitter. And as always, follow us as well. You can hit the like button, subscribe button for us. This is Investing Against the Grain. Thank you for watching. Enjoy. Welcome back, everybody. If you're new, my name is Nicholas. This is Investing Against the Grain. I've got the honor and the privilege of having Hans Nelson on today to just have a candid conversation. Obviously, we'll talk about Tesla. Earnings just happened, so we'll dive into that a little bit. And then just to get to know you know, the man behind the amazing name and what's he about, what, what's he, where's he from, just everything, right? He's, uh, he's, I think, kind of coming onto the scene. We've seen him all over the place. And every time he speaks, it um, aligns with the way I think. And maybe it's because we both have engineering backgrounds, but it's, uh, it's like music to my ears when I hear how his rationale and the way he speaks and the way he lays out thoughts. So, Hopefully you guys enjoy this and Hans, welcome. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me here. I always enjoy getting to have candid conversations in general. And um, yeah, I know that I think about things in a little bit different way than a lot of other people in the Tesla community. And so, like you said, it's nice to connect with people who think about things from more of an engineering and first principle standpoint, um, maybe a little bit less in the finances and then um, trying to connect the macro environment and the overall world that we live in back to the investment thesis. So yeah, I mean, looking forward to this. I think we're going to have fun. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, uh, let's, you know, elephant in the room here. Tesla stock is down nine, call it nine and a half percent down to $219. What'd you make of yesterday? I mean, I know we were on a live stream together. There's a lot of talking, um, not a lot of room for deeper thoughts, or you know, somewhat mm -hmm. debates, but uh, I was just curious. What was your takeaway uh, from from the earnings call, the report, just all around? Um, my biggest takeaway was that there wasn't really anything new that I learned on the call uh, that would change my investment thesis in any way. And it's like you have to listen to the earnings calls just to see, you know, there's a chance that something really material could drop for me and having a very long-term time horizon, I'm looking at how they're executing. Um, and it seems like all of the plans are on track for the five, 10, 15 year time horizons. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't walk away from it really knowing anything that I didn't know coming into it other than yes, okay, we're gonna get the Cybertruck delivery event, but we kind of knew it was, yeah. you know, whether, in the long-term time horizon, whether it's in November or if it's in January of next year, you know, really does, as long as it's, you know, getting close. Um, and then we'll get to watch that. So, yeah, I think that I'm not surprised by the market reaction. I didn't really know what the market was going to say either way. Um, and I've just disconnected from the people who are very emotionally reactive to movements in the stock price. Like volatility is something that I know 
is the price of actually achieving outsized gains over the long term. And, you know, I'm very comfortable with the position I have. I'm very comfortable with my cost basis. I'm very comfortable with the gains that I've made thus far. And I'm undeterred in my vision of what this company is going to be deep into the future. So, yeah, it's like the market's going to do what the market's going to do. I don't have to sell right now. I don't care. Um, and I see that, you know, most of the movement in the market seems to be driven by people who have a completely different risk tolerance and time horizon than I have. And it's like, okay, you know, if you need to sell in the next couple of months, well, maybe this means a lot more to you than it does to me. I just don't care. Yeah. Yeah. It seems, uh, wh whether it's on X or, you know, I, I don't want to say specifically our stream, but just in general, the YouTube community, it seems like everybody gets so tunnel vision into what Tesla's doing. And I think it's fair to compare Tesla against Tesla, but sometimes it seems like there's like a, a it like people act as if it's in a vacuum and they don't, mm -hmm. don't take into account what's happening in the world. I mean, every single thing I've seen today on X has just completely ignored the fact that, yeah, Elon kind of hinted that it's going to be probably lower production. We're going to be cautious that there are headwinds, but we still had, you know, 15% margins. We still had, you know, record year over year deliveries. We're still on track for a 50% CAGR. We, we, I mean, we have Cybertruck coming out. Meanwhile, if you look at the other automakers, they're in shambles right now, right? They're struggling. And that, again, I would say isn't, it's not all the economy with like the, UA, uh, with the UAW strike going on, but a lot of it is the economy. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing how all these companies are reacting, but that seems to be just out of the conversation all of a sudden. I mean, do you, what's your sentiment on that when you look at it holistically? I, I would 100% agree with that. And I think, so a lot of the things that I heard on the call that a lot of other people would take as being negative, I actually took as a positive, but it's because my goals, my values, uh, the things that I'm looking for from management are aligned with Tesla, their own management and their own goals. You know, Tesla's not looking to maximize profits this year, next year, two years down the road. They're looking to be the biggest company in the world. And so they're making decisions that are aligned with being able to reasonably defend a pathway to be the biggest company in the world. And so they're looking out at the world and they see increasing geopolitical instability. They see the need to, like, they forecasted that they needed to have localized supply chains, you know, before a lot of the other companies. They've been looking into the future and they've been preparing for things that other people didn't see. And I think that this is another example of that, that they see that, hey, things could really continue to deteriorate over the next year, the next two years, you know, potentially even beyond that, it's hard to say. It really all depends. And so they are making a set of decisions today that maximizes their long-term survivability. They want more cash in the bank. They want not to invest in things that are going to actually bleed their cash if times get hard. Um, they are look, they're investing heavily in the asymmetric potential upside things. Um, and they're really looking as a core company at focusing on artificial intelligence. And, you know, I think the comment about baby AGI yeah. is something that a lot of people are, you know, they're going to say, oh, whatever, you know, he's talked about FSD, blah, blah, blah. Um, they just do not understand what Tesla is doing. They don't believe uh, that artificial intelligence, you know, when they think of artificial intelligence, they just don't think of Tesla. They think of OpenAI and Microsoft and Google and all these other companies. Um, and when I look at the company, that's not what I see. I see people that are ruthlessly focused. You know, they have a world-class team and they're ruthlessly focused on applying the learnings of AI to real world problems. Um, and when I say real world problems, I'm talking about physical space problems. Um, and so in conversations with 
Farzad, I've started talking about this as meat space GPT, that they are really trying to create a an intelligent being that can operate in three-dimensional space just like our meat fingers can. And um, you know, that's gonna be something that's completely different than Chat GPT, which operates pretty much entirely in the space of information and ideas and not embodiment. Um, and when we look out at the world, how much of the economy is information and how much of the economy is physical stuff? And physical stuff is definitely huge. And honestly, we've seen a real lack of innovation in physical things for you know decades and decades now. And so it's exciting to see the ability to give robots brains and have them be able to interact with the world in an intelligent manner. And cars are just one example of that. There's lots of other possibilities. And so, you know, it was very logical for them to move from cars into the Optimus bot. And so they they're working on all the core pieces that allow us to fundamentally change what the meaning of the economy is, the amount of abundance that's available to society, our ability to solve the hardest problems in the world. Um, I've had some great conversations with Adam Dore from Rethink X, and I love the way that he frames, you know, he's a climate scientist and he comes from a scientific belief that climate change is an existential crisis that humanity faces. But he's the only one that I know of who instead of looking at that and freaking out and thinking that we need to slow down and decelerate and practice restraint and degrow and all these things that crazy people think is going to be the solution to that problem, he thinks that we absolutely will solve all of these problems based on our rate of technological innovation and our ability to create abundance that you need resources in order to solve these big problems. And, um, you know, Tesla is a company that is putting in all of the foundational elements necessary to create those resources. Um, and so, you know, those are the things that when he talks, I hear and I'm like, okay, we're still on track. We're still on track. Um, and, you know, the fact that we're going to go through potentially a very difficult economic season over the next couple of years does not change the fact that 20 years from now, all electric. And very highly likely we have incredibly capable artificial intelligence, whether that's artificial general intelligence or not, like those things are going to arrive. And the people that are going to actually be successful in those areas are the people who are still alive um, and who have invested heavily in that, who have led the development. And, you know, when you look at Ford, when you look at GM, when you look at these other automotive companies that the stock market, they're saying, hey, these companies are so big, therefore they must continue to exist and they must be able to compete with Tesla. It's like, no, they must not. Like how many times do we have to see these ginormous companies explode before we realize that actually death is an inevitable part of the life cycle for any of these companies. Um, so, you know, if you want to look at Blockbuster, if you want to look at yeah. um, uh, not General, Mo Sears. General Electric, Sears, yeah, yeah. yeah like all see. these companies, um, you can see that there's a, a rigidity that takes over in a company and it just gets to be so slow moving and so it's just like a Titanic, you know, and it's headed for an iceberg and you can see that it's coming and you have zero ability to turn the ship fast enough to avoid hitting yeah. the iceberg and sinking. Um, and so, yeah, that's <clears throat> when, when people say, Hey, you know, Tesla has a PE that's way higher than anyone else in the automotive market. It was like, yeah, what other company in the automotive market, you know, even if you want to look at the other EV makers, you know, none of them are profitable. Tough economic times makes it more likely that Lucid and Rivian and these other companies that are trying, you know, they've got the right ideas, they've got the right product segment, but do they have the resiliency and the resources 
to survive when times get tough? I don't know. Like Tesla is guaranteed to survive the automotive market over the next 10 years. No one else is in the financial position that they are. No one has the balance sheet. No one has the engineering talent. No one has the product superiority. And so when you look at those things, it's like, yeah, I mean, things are going to crap. And if you need to preserve capital in the coming crisis, well, you know, that's a tough spot to be in. I just know that I don't have to sell anytime soon. And so I want to be invested in those companies that are still going to be around 10 years from now. And not only are going to be around, but they're going to be massive winners compared to today. Yeah. Wow. Well said. That was all really well said, but let's, um, let's, let's focus real for a little bit here on the macro and even you, you live in Austin, right? Uh, no, I'm East Texas. So in East between Texas. Dallas and Louisiana. Oh, oh, okay. Nice. Um, so let, let's focus on the macro and your own, you know, microeconomic experiences that you're seeing S something that, you know, it, it was funny. Um, I retweeted a post today, uh, by, or I reposted a post <laughs> by, uh, Gary Black today where he was essentially making the argument that Tesla vehicles have gone from a thousand dollar a month down to like $900 a month. And his contention is that, wow, we've come down massively in costs for Tesla. Like, they're not the same as they were. Mm -hmm. When I read that, I felt like it was extremely out of touch with reality. The, the, the part that he's still missing, in my opinion, is that whether it's $800, $900, $1,000 a month, that's a lot for people to be shelling out for a vehicle. And it's not just because it's expensive for a vehicle, but it's what's led up to that. Why are we at such high prices now, despite how much Tesla has really brought down the cogs, the cost of goods sold, right? Despite them, you know, maniacally working to get the cost of goods down, they are somehow still around that same price, 900 to a thousand dollars. But it seems like everybody thinks of it as, as if it's in a vacuum, meaning, okay, well, it's gone from a thousand to 900. So they should be able to afford it. it shouldn't be a big deal, but it's as if they forget that, well, it's not just that the car is still expensive. It's that my rent is now more expensive. It's that my electric bill is up. It's that my grocery bills are up. It's that, you know what? I still want to go out. And I still want to eat because, you know, if I can't buy a new house, if I can't buy a new car, I need to have some happiness in life. And, you know, we're still going to live and we're still going to have means of funds. And that means going out. Maybe that means going to Chipotle. Chipotle raises their prices like every three months, you know, and, and it's all that compounds together to make it where a person who, you know, is already kind of struggling on a month to month basis, even if they want a Tesla, they can't afford it. Yes, it went from a thousand a month down to nine hundred, but and that you you just see that hundred dollar delta of like, oh, well, that should be a reprieve. But you miss that. Mm -hmm. everything yeah, overall that purchasing that power has, exactly, has just been down. eviscerated. Absolutely, I, I think that that your point there was really on point. And um, yeah, like people, like you said, it is out of touch because people who, you know, if their purchasing power is eroded by 10% this year. Like they have so much margin in their life that, ah, you know, that, that sucks, but whatever. Like I'm still going to be able to do exactly all of the same things next year that I was able to do this year. And that's just not the case for, you know, the vast majority of Americans and the vast majority of people around the world. And so as all of the other things in their life become more expensive, it means that they don't have the ability to spend things on discretionary items. And honest to goodness, new cars are discretionary spending items. Like yeah. when you're flush, yeah, you can afford that new car and that new car payment. When you have to be on a budget, apparently that uh, 2005 Honda Accord that gets 30 miles to the gallon and you, know, you can purchase in cash, like all of a sudden that eliminates tons of pressure on your monthly cash flow. Um, and so people start having to look at things more in that lens. And yeah, so I think that that's 100% correct. The other thing that I just want to kind of go on a little bit of a tangent, but it is related, is that um, if you've ever read The Righteous Mind, 
it's really interesting. And this is just kind of a psychological fact that, you know, our rational mind is built on top of our emotional brain. And our emotional brain is the elephant that steers the ship. And then we've got, you know, the little neocortex rider on top and it's got some influence, but like when the elephant wants to do what the elephant wants to do, guess what wins, you know, it's the elephant. So, and the more intelligent a person is, the more they can rationalize why they wanted to do what the elephant wanted to do, even though the elephant was the one in control the whole time. Um, and so when I look at someone like Gary Black, he exists in an environment where he has a certain set of incentives and those incentives are heavily short-term focused. You know, they talk about long-term time horizons, like two years, like, uh, no, that's not long-term. Like any institution that needs to survive over actual long-term, like decades to centuries, you know, two years is a drop in the bucket. And if you want to build wealth, you know, over the course of decades, you need to be looking at companies that are also thinking in decades. Um, and Gary's just not thinking in decades. Like he's thinking about this quarter, next quarter. Um, and he thinks that he can time the market and all of these things. And when you step back and you look at it, there's a reason that all these active managers underperform the S&P yeah. and they underperform the NASDAQ. It's because they think they're smart and they're reacting to things that are short-term reasons. And there's only one manager that I know of who's active right now, who's beating all that. And that's Ron Barron. Ron Barron. Yeah. Yep. And why? Because Ron Barron thinks long-term and he doesn't sell his winners because things got hard. Um, you know, go back to Peter Lynch. He said he's lost way more money selling winners early on in the game, you know, his thing that he preached was know what inning you're in. Don't sell a winner in the second inning when, you know, you still got seven innings left to play, even if they're overvalued and their PE yeah. is too high. It's like, yeah, you could, uh, you know, you could get a base hit and miss out on a grand slam. Like, and he said he's lost way more money missing those grand slams than he ever lost on companies that he was invested in going to zero. He said, you know, I've done that. I've invested in things and I've lost a hundred percent of what I invested in them. Um, but then I've also invested in things and I made two or three X on my money. And then it went on to 10 or 20 X is like losing it almost hurts worse. Yeah. Losing 17 times gains because you got a triple sucks way more than, you know, one thing going to zero. So yeah, I, <clears throat> and bringing that back to Gary, you know, he's got an incredibly built out worldview and system and intelligence that is all focused around how do I make sense of this short term? And he's operating inside of an environment and a system that does not focus on the correct items and structurally just mathematically like you look at it there's a reason that these active managers don't overperform and so you know he can have really great arguments that can be created to make sense of all the things um and people look at wall street insiders like they really know what they're doing and you know the truth of the matter is that stock pickers just don't know any more about what they're doing than we do. They just look like they do and they sound like they do. And so we believe them like they do, but they don't. Um, <clears throat> and so, but the other thing you have to take into account is that those people control a lot of the money in the market. And so when Gary Black is squawking on, or, you know, squawk share is another one, you know, he's a great squawker. Um, when these people are freaking out, I actually am like, okay, that's, you know, that's a good thing to know. That's a good indicator. Buying opportunities are probably approaching because go back to Warren Buffett, you know, the stock market is a mechanism for transferring wealth from the impatient to the patient. I know what this company is going to be worth over the long term. If you don't believe it and you're scared because you think that 
the next couple of quarters are going to be rough, then I'll take your shares off you for cheap. Like, yeah, yeah, it's a good signal. Long. So, but so what, you know, moving away from, I guess, just Wall Street in general, what's your take right now with, with the economy? What do you think is going on? I mean, do you think we're in a recession? Do you think we're going into a recession? Do you think, you know, this is going to lead to an await thing? Or do you think the Fed's going to start cutting? I mean, do you have thoughts on this mm -hmm. or uh, an idea of what you think may or may not be happening? Obviously, knowing that we're, yeah. ne we're never going to know until like three years out. Yes. Uh, yeah. And obviously, none of this is financial advice either, either. Like I have my position, my own risk tolerances and um, my my goals. And those are going to lead me to make one set of decisions, which probably are different than 99% of other people. Um, that said, I think that large changes in technology create turbulent times. And I think we have been and continue to be in the internet itself was an incredibly disruptive piece of technology. And it created an earthquake in the substrate of society that has been slowly was so poetic <laughs> yeah it's been slowly like rising to larger and larger levels and um and then ai is going to do like the same thing over again and i just don't think we've dealt with all of the consequences of that i think there's still lots to be decided there are lots of new opportunities to be taken advantage of um, but a lot of the social structures and institutions that were built over the last couple hundred years um, were built on assumptions about the way that information flowed from person to person in a society that are fundamentally wrong assumptions today. Um, and so a lot of what we see in the way that government function, you know, institutions have basically been laid bare over the last 20 years for being what they always were. We just never had the insight to see and that yeah. is, it's a story making machine and the story is false. It's bullshit. And it always was bullshit. And we just never had the information to be able to prove that it was bullshit. Um, and so it's like, now we have this crisis of trust and we have a crisis of trust in Wall Street. We have a crisis of trust in capitalism. We have a crisis of trust in government and media news everything yep. yeah yes yeah i mean that's... our food our food we consume it's like everything everything right? it's yeah and that's that's the thing like when you wake up and you realize like all these things were always broken i mean we all experience these things in our day-to-day -day lives and we never really were able to make the logical leap that everything is like you know the company that you work at you know it's crap like <laughs> there's so many dumb people doing so many dumb things like left, right, and center. And, you know, sometimes you're the one who's being smart and understanding it. And, you know, half the time you're the dumb one doing the dumb things. It's like, I've had this personal experience over and over again, but we think, Oh, you know, those people over there in those important institutions, they're different. You know, they've got their crap together and it's all fixed and figured out. And it's like, no, they're the same as you. They're the exact same as you and they're telling the same lies and stories and justifications and narratives. And, um, it, it is funny how, I mean, I've worked for some, you know, fairly large companies and, you know, before you get there, you always think, oh man, they must have everything figured out because they're such a big company. And then you get there and you realize, oh, like it, it's not like they have everything figured out. It's not like there's a clear cut way, do this like this and this like that. And then it all works out. And then once you've done that enough times to your point, when you've been at these companies and you realize we're all just trying to figure it out, mm -hmm. like we're all, it's just, here's a collective who had an idea, that idea came out well, and now you're just adding more and more people, but everyone's just trying to figure it out. So when you see someone like Gary Black or someone at, at you know Goldman Sachs or whatever, they don't necessarily know. I mean, the amount of people who have been calling for a recession nonstop, the amount of people who have been, you know, you, you see all the times, uh, the bulls and the bears, they're constantly arguing. They're both apparently geniuses. They, they both sides apparently know a lot, have big degrees, Harvard, whatever you want to call it, Wharton School of Business, work for big firms. And yet 
like yet somehow all these smart people who should know everything apparently disagree all the time all the time right it, it, it's comical yep. so so then it it leads you to believe well then they don't really know anything because one of them's right but they both think they're right and that can't be true so or neither is of them right? is right or, or neither is right right yeah exactly and so and that's where i think i think uh uniquely uh tesla the our investor community and you have this with some other companies like i think apple had it for a long time where the you know the the retail investors definitely had the edge definitely had the edge on wall street um, a lot of it was patience but a lot of it was also deep diving into these companies mm -hmm. right i i i don't know i mean you can even have like someone like a ross gerber or a gary black or whoever you want I don't think they understand these companies as well as, as many of us do because we've put the time in. I mean, even if they understand the balance sheet, go for it. You know what? Frankly, mm -hmm. that's not my strong suit. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's just math. And it's just numbers and they can be tweaked to make it look better or not. But what yeah. I understand Thank you, is... Jack Welsh. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I understand and I think what you understand is, is or, or, or little things, right? Like, Nobody talked about this on the stream yesterday, but to me, one of the most important things that was said, and you know, you and I have uh, talked about this, you know, on on you know DMs on X uh, with Farzad, but Elon mentioned that the NVIDIA H100 cluster is almost fully online. Mm -hmm. Right. And we've been talking about that, but people have dismissed the importance of that and how hard that was and how, you know, it's been a struggle to get this up and running. Well, not only did they get that it up huge. and running, but he said we've got it up and running faster than anyone has ever got a cluster of this size up and running. Yeah. And that is that's a leading indicator. So people confuse leading indicators and lagging indicators all the time. And they think, you know, most of what shows up in the balance sheet and the P&L those are lagging indicators and you have to figure out as a business, how do you do the right things as your daily disciplines to drive those lagging indicators so that everything looks good when you get to your quarterly earnings. Um, but what is going to be the leading indicators moving forward are going to be, in my opinion, two core things. How do you architect a culture? in the 21st century that accounts for the amount of information that is freely available to anyone and everyone inside of your organization. How do you architect that organization and keep it pointed in the right direction 100% of the time and utilize 100% of the resources at your disposal to move as fast as you can in that direction? That's a leading indicator. And the other one is technology. You know, are you working with the best technology to solve the hardest problems? And all of those things are where Tesla wins, wins, and wins again. No one operates a company of 100,000 people that every single one of those people is able to come into work that day and do the best thing that they can possibly think of to do to improve the long-term viability of Tesla 10 years from now. So if you have a company that has figured out how to do that culturally at that scale in a world where companies of 100 people can't even figure out how to coordinate and move in the same direction, that company over the long term, you know, you can talk about all of the ins and outs and relative things like over short periods of time where you think someone might win, but over the long yeah. term, you can't lie. That's going to show up in all of the results. You know, honestly, I think the only other company that has figured out how to operate at a pretty decent scale that competes with Tesla on a culture front, and I don't think that they're equal to, but at least they're in the same league and category is NVIDIA. Like Jensen runs a ridiculously tight ship and what they have been able to accomplish and how he's been able to grow that company has been insane. You, you're a hundred percent correct. I mean, I don't know if you know anybody that works there. I have several, several friends who, who work there and they, people there are lifers. Like yep. They, they don't want to leave, even if it's for more money because their team, their management, their product. I mean, it's, it's 
it's just so it, it's just on a, another level. I mean, they, they feel like they are in this seminal moment and they've been in the seminal moment year after year after year. Yep. Right. Like they, they've just been leading it. Um, yeah, it, it's insane. I, I, I agree with you on that. Um, so something else uh, that I took away that I didn't think, again, I, I don't think it's gotten enough attention that when Elon said this, but it's it's pretty profound. And I get it. Elon says some things and people just tend to disregard it. But baby AGI. That's a really big deal because people keep talking about AI and, you know, people keep saying generative AI. I, I really struggle to think of generative AI as AI. I, I don't know. There's something in my mind where it's like, it's almost like a cop out, right? It's like, we're saying we, we've talked about AI for so long and now we have, you know, chat GPT and everyone's like, oh, we have AI. Well, it's generative AI. And it's like, it's like, well, it's kind of AI, not really it's AI light mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm which it is in my opinion, but what Tesla's doing and you said it uh, beautifully before is they're, they're, they're interacting with the real world. It's very easy to, to interact with a virtual world. And I don't want to say easy. I, I don't, I, you know, give, give open AI their flowers, you know, GPT, uh, you know, amazing transformer. That's really, you know, taken off and they've iterated on it. They've been able to build a, a chat experience on top of it, which garnered the imaginations of the world. That's nothing to, to just dismiss. But with that said, it's not interacting in the real world. That's hard. Physical space is very difficult because that's taking, that's, that's taking all of the compute and the physical hardware and adding in acceleration and velocity and dexterity and just all these different disciplines that we just take for granted and that the the, the baby agi just it is so it's such a great term I, do you have fsd no so i actually don't have a tesla yet i just own tesla's worth of shares <laughs> okay fair enough um so i have um I, i'm on 10.4.7.2 it looks like three might be coming out soon and, but you've written it, right? Mm, yes. And with Farzad, I've seen that video at least. Um, after you've been in it for a while, it really does feel like it has a mind of its own. And it does. It's making its own decisions based on the input from the world and its understanding of the world, which is no different than what we do as humans. And that baby AGI comment, I thought was so profound, not even so much for the vehicles, but because of the humanoid, I mean, I was curious, like what, what that phrase, like what, what did that say anything to you? Did it mean anything to you? Cause to me, when I heard that, it's like, man, like, and, and we only know what we see and what they show mm -hmm. us. Right. Yeah. So, so I'm curious if that, I think that we have you. somewhat of an advantage in this area, <clears throat> um, being engineers that we understand the mathematical complexity of solving these interactions in a determinate way like you know once you introduce the number like you have to understand what a degree of freedom is and what the addition of an extra degree of freedom does mm -hmm. to the complexity of the calculations that you have to do to figure out a problem and that's something that you deal with intimately as an engineering student like you get it that you're constantly trying to simplify and simplify and simplify the problem down and make all the assumptions necessary so that it's mathematically solvable. And when you interact with the real world, you don't get to make those simplifications. You have to deal with the actual complexity, infinite degrees of freedom. And so, yeah, like you can throw the world's worth of compute at problems that actually have that number of degrees of freedom and they can't solve it. But somehow this little squishy mass of noodles up here <laughs> has figured out how to deal with all that stuff. And so that's the the fun thing about, you know, I would push back a little bit. I think that um, what OpenAI has created is like it is artificial and it is intelligent. Now, is it the same type of intelligence as humans have? Definitely it's different. And it seems like 
you know, in some ways I get confused looking at it, you know, did they recreate a neocortex that is completely divorced from all of the other limbic system and all of the uh, brainstem areas? Or did they create the brainstem areas and not the neocortex? I, I'm not exactly sure, but whatever it is, like it is a very weird amorphous thing and it has intelligence, but it's very alien. It operates differently than we operate because it does not yet have, like we don't have a deep enough understanding of how our brain works to really recreate that in a digital form. And, um, and we certainly haven't even tried to recreate all of the different parts that we know are in our brain and give those to an artificial form factor yet. So it, it is completely, it is completely alien. But the other thing that I think is spot on with your analogy is that when it operates entirely in the information space, that it doesn't have to deal with those same number of degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. that the degrees of freedom in a digital purely digital format are dramatically constrained. Um, and so when you embody it, when you give it a way to interact physically and to get feedback on, you know, I moved my limbs and I thought I was going to be at, you know, the deterministic solution said my fingers would be here and wait a second, they're not there. And so now you've got all those calibration issues and you have to do that dynamically on the fly in real time, all the time. Um, that you cannot use the classic tools that we've yep. used to figure other things out. And so I think that that use case is going to force, you know, they're not trying to solve how do we win go? They're trying to solve how do we do real stuff in the real world? And by going after a goal that is that big, hairy, and audacious, they are going to create something magical. Like they have all of the pieces in place. Now, can we predict exactly what that's going to look like 10, 15, 20 years from now? Probably not. Like, we just don't know. Did the Gutenberg understand what, yeah, what he did? Yeah. the printing press was going to do? Like, you know, <clears throat> and the thing with that period of time I love, I love thinking about this one because technology moved much slower and information diffused throughout the population much slower. And there was all these limits on, okay, so you've got a printing press, but now you got to like increase the supply chain necessary to where you have enough paper and ink and blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, it took a long time from the time that Gutenberg invented the printing press until everyone in Europe had access to books and pamphlets, like every single person. By the time that happened, Society in Europe crumbled. 30 years war. More people died in Europe during the 30 years war than any other, like as far as a percentage of the population, than any other major conflict in history, uh, in the history of Europe. And <clears throat> we have done something similar, going back to what I was saying earlier about macro environment. The internet is that scale of transformation. And just the way that those institutions that were built on no information access to the general public has access to some information, it's still controlled by whoever has the printing press, but there's, you know, everyone has access to some information. And that's where we get the enlightenment. So like incredible technological innovation, incredible destruction and disruption to all of our social structures. And then on top of that, you get the enlightenment you get the scientific revolution, you get the age of reason, you get the founding fathers who are able to actually give us the constitution that we have that allow us to have this incredible nation. Um, and so like, it's gonna be crazy and messy. And now we're seeing those scales of things happen in decades instead of centuries. And we just don't understand like the ability of artificial intelligence now, not only to take in all that information that we all as humans have, but then to process it and, and have access to the same types of experiences that we have by being embodied. Like we just don't know the 
destructive capability of what that's going to do and the incredible potential of what can be built in the ruins of what gets destroyed. Um, and so that's why I spend so much time like looking at history, looking at society, looking at the macro environment, looking at the state of technology that we have today and trying to understand the moving pieces because I know that what we're in store for is going to be mind boggling that we just don't even begin to fathom what the world will look like 20 years from now. And because it's coming so fast, you know, these things took generations and now they're going to happen in lifetimes. Um, and the, like, it's going to be incredible chaos and it's going to be incredible creation. And so I'd like want to have yeah. at least some sort of an idea of what's going to happen and a knowledge of the pieces that are in play. Um, and even with all of that, it's just too much to, to be able to reasonably and intelligently project forward. So, so it's, it's clear that you're a student of history. Um, they, it almost sounds like you've even read this book called, uh, guns, germs, and steel, which you haven't, if you haven't, it's, it's, I haven't, book. yeah, put um, it on the list. Yeah. But I mean, talking about, you know, industrial revolution, enlightenment period, right. Going into, you know, the time period we're in now, um, I said that backwards, but <laughs> you get the point. So understanding history, a lot of times there's a, there's an analogy made and maybe it's a mistake, but I, I'd love to hear you your take on it on the way you know from 2000 to now the way technology has played out i'll give you some examples um e-commerce right it's pretty much become amazon.com and everybody else is playing second fiddle or trying to be second fiddle um search engines right a search engine you would have thought that people would have been like there's no way you're gonna have a monopoly for a search engine anybody can do this it's not that proprietary Nah, it's Google, um, the phone market, right? It's pretty much Apple, Android, and then I guess if you're in China, Huawei. Um, I mean, you you see these trends go mm -hmm. on and on and on, right? You see in the PC world, you see it in in the clouds, right? Uh, you know, it's pretty much AWS and Azure. Like you see this repeated over and over. But for some reason, when it comes to things like FSD, or if it comes to Optimus it seems like there's a, a sentiment out there, obviously not within our community, but there's a sentiment out there that that history and that rhythm that we've seen won't continue to take place. And not even just with FSD, which is really what I want to understand from you, but even from an automotive perspective, right? People sit there and they say, it's there's no way you're only going to have two or three automakers in the world. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, but people said the exact same thing about the phone industry, right? People said the exact same thing about, you know, the, the music industry, right? People are like, no, everybody's not just going to have an iPod, right? I mean, but we see this happening over and over again. So one, I guess, what's your take? Do you think that's possible to happen based on history? Or do you think it's more of history, you know, rhymes, but doesn't necessarily repeat? Um, but yeah, so what's your take on that from an EV perspective? Can that happen with Tesla being kind of the, the majority? And then same thing with FSD. What's your take on that? So I think that it's, I always am interested to know who is saying what. And one of the things that... Real quick, but before you go on, shout out to my wife. She just brought me this amazing lunch. Just, mm, that looks delicious. Yeah. So I just, want, I just want to do that because I know Farzad always brags about Cindy. And yeah, so... What's up, Cindy? Where you at? Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, Cindy just brought me food, Farzad. <laughs> oh. right, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I like to take notice of is who is saying what and what's their background. And the correlation that seems pretty obvious to me is that the people are saying that we can't have one automaker or that there won't be one winner in FSD are not technology people. Mm -hmm. The thing is that because Tesla is a car company, it gets analyzed and compared and understood by people who are experts in the history of the automotive industry. And the automotive industry has been devoid of technological 
innovation and disruption yeah. for 80 years. And so if everything that you know about how the world works is in this silo of how this one market has existed and operated for the past 80 years, you will believe that there are things that are true about the world that are patently not true and that people who are not outside of your sector can tell you all day long, no, that's not how the world works. You just have an unrepresentative sample size of reality that causes you to infer things that were dependent variables of other things that were held constant. And when you start changing those other variables, then the dependencies that you think are laws are shown to be downstream consequences. And so I think that if you understand technology and a power law and the asymmetric outcomes that are possible with incredible leverage, then all of a sudden you realize, yeah, you know, the car industry is not any different than any other and software is eating the world. Exactly. More and more and more of these physical things that we thought were in a silo that was not touched by technology, they will be. It's just a matter of time. And so you can believe that the world operates on 20th century principles and be very confident because you have decades or hundreds of years worth of data to back up these assumptions and then, you know, I love the thing that Ray Dalio says, there are lots of things that have never happened in my lifetime that when I actually look at history, I find out they've happened lots of times. These are normal and easily predictable patterns once you understand the long arc of history and the technological disruption of highly competitive commoditized markets is one of those things. So yes, yeah. I 100% believe that there will, not only can there be, there probably will be less than five like manufacturers of vehicles. Um, well, so I mean, it, these probably will end up being a lot like geographical monopolies depending Agreed. on um, the way the geopolitics plays out that, you know, as countries have to be more and more dependent on their own national resources. Um, yeah, we'll see more potentially than, than five in the world, but like in a market, you'll probably see less than three. Um, and that's what it'll coalesce to over time. Yeah. The big, the big gap that I see a lot of people fall into over and over, you know, with Tesla, and this is really just speaking from from the hardware of the vehicles itself is that much like the phone industry you know people thought that there's no way it was going to take over and they got caught up on this what's in my hands what they seem to just i mean don't get me wrong this this has to be beautiful right and this is gorgeous it is but and so the cars are going to have to be beautiful they're going to have to be well made and all that but what everybody seems to miss, and I don't know why, because it seems like the most obvious thing in the world to me is that it's what's inside the phone. It's the software. The software is where the, the, the real revolution in lies. And I think that's what all these people tend to always miss. And you can tell that they've never been in a Tesla, right? I mean, it's like uh, Gordon Johnson, right? He always says, Oh no, I would never go into a, a Tesla. It will kill me and all this stuff. Like, they, mm -hmm. then you're missing it. You're missing mm -hmm. it. You're missing how intuitive everything is. You're missing what the charging experience is like. You're, you're missing, you know, just forget FSD, just autopilot on the highway, like just mm -hmm. how stable it is. This is what you're missing. And this is what it's going to get to a point where, you know, I don't, I don't use this for phone calls, right? I don't use it for phone calls and the same way cars will change. We won't use cars for driving. Cars will be for us to go in and sit and do work or go in mm -hmm. and instead of paying for a flight and having to go through TSA and all that, it'll be just to get from where I'm at here to Miami because it's, you know, four hours and it's just more convenient that way. Right. And I can leave at whatever time I can sleep on the way there. Right. It's, it's going to be much more akin to a train 
right? I, I don't care much about a train, but I care, is it going to get me point A to point B? Is it cost effective? Is it, do you have a nice cabin to sit in? Can I do my work there? Is there Wi-Fi? right? That's what's going to matter. It's not going to be, well, everybody wants their own car to look their own way because that was the argument with this. Everyone was saying like people are, people want different phones. They want different looks. They want to have these covers on them and all this stuff. And that narrative was just so mistaken. And it's unreal that people continue to think that that's what's going to happen with, with vehicles. But maybe, but, but maybe I'm, I'm thinking that this is going to happen a lot sooner than what it is. Maybe that's their point. Like maybe that's, there's some validity to that, but in order to, get from here to there it's it's got to start at a certain point and at a certain point you're going to see there be people who are becoming winners and mm -hmm. benefit from that on a market perspective while the other people keep getting hurt and hurt and hurt which i think is what we're seeing actively with vw with gm with ford i mean how how are you thinking about this when it comes to autonomy like what's what's your sentiment like i imagine because you're thinking long term part of that thesis is it's obviously very grounded with autonomy, but where do you see it coming in? Where, where do you see it becoming a, you know, something where I can just pull up my Tesla app and call a Tesla to pick me up and go point A to point B? Yeah, I think the the point that you made about time horizons is a huge one. Like maybe it will take longer. And if if you are someone who's investing in a time horizon of six months, a year, two years, it's hard to make a confident investment around the thesis that autonomy is going to play out or not play out because it's really yeah. hard to predict exactly when that thing is going to be. You know, this is something that's true of complex systems that they work until they don't. And like, there's a whole lot of pressure building up inside of a complex system that is going to be the end of that system, but you can't tell exactly like what's going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. And so in this way, they're, discontinuous you know a lot of history has been very linear very easy to predict um but when and the world that we live in is full of complex systems that are if you read nasim taleb very not anti-fragile like they're built up to minimize all the little risks and then they're susceptible to the big one and the auto market is this way the way that people view the auto market is this way um and so I, it's really hard to tell when that shift is going to happen. But if you understand Moore's law, if you understand the explosion in compute capacity that we're going to have, like we've already started the Moore's law of intelligence that, you know, there's a specific period of time and I'm not even sure what it's, it's not that long. It's like six to 12 months, I think that's like the total intelligence. And by that, they mean, you know, what are the flops available yeah. on our planet earth are doubling. And it's like, we're just, it's not going to be long before synthetic flops dramatically Exceed outnumber us. human flops. And we're, like as humans, we're pretty dang creative. We're going to figure out how to maximize the usefulness of them flops. And so like something's going to break, something's got to give, and we're going to be able to do things that we never thought were possible. Um, I think that it is almost inconceivable that 10 years from now that Tesla does not have a robo taxi service or that there is a robo taxi service that operates on Tesla vehicles. Um, and probably, you know, much, much more than that. And so, if I believe that, and then I also believe that whatever the intelligence was that they figured out to make robo-taxis possible is also applicable to a lot of other of the biggest problems that humanity has, then it's like Tesla's a no-brainer over the next 10 years. Do you think they have the right approach? I do. I mean, it's the only one that makes sense. Like, it is the only anti-fragile approach. When you look at what Waymo and Cruz and all these other companies are doing, they're trying to, like we talked about earlier, solve all these hard mathematical problems by creating simplifications instead of building the intelligence that's necessary to be able to operate with the degrees of freedom that the real world presents. They're trying to live inside of a bubble of not having to deal with those degrees of freedom. And that's just not going to be scalable.
because so, whatever those assumptions are that they're making to reduce that complexity are not robust assumptions that are transferable to different scenarios. Like you can't even move from one city to a different city, much less from one continent to a different continent or from one type of task to a different type of task. So, but Cruise seems to be, I mean, they're scaling. Um, how fast are they scaling? I guess that's, that's a question to be asked or how successful are they in these cities? Just because they're in these cities doesn't mean that they're that wide in the city. Doesn't mean that they're that successful. Mm -hmm doesn't mean they're profitable, right? Because you can't just, even if you scale, but if you scale unprofitably, you're dead, right? So if you had to, I guess, I guess if you were, you know, part of Cruise, a part of Waymo, and you were going to straw man your side against what Tesla's doing, like, what, what do you think they're thinking? Or do you think they're thinking, damn, that is a better approach, but we don't have the fleet, we can't do this? How do you think they're thinking about it? Because we don't hear that much from them, to be honest, around this front. Yeah. Um, I think that it's hard to know what people inside those companies today are thinking, especially, um, especially Waymo, just because Google as a company understands artificial intelligence. And so I don't understand how Waymo is not all in on an artificial intelligence approach to this. You know, all these other companies, they were started by people and in a time when we did not have the access to synthetic intelligence that we have today. And so they they were pursuing the problem the best way with the best technology that was available at that time. And they, as tools became available that were different, they never updated their assumptions about what was possible. Um, and I think even there are companies that are started today by these old legacy companies. Well, when an old legacy company is going out to find someone to solve this problem, who is it that they trust? It's other people who think about the world in the same worldview and mindset that they think about things. And so these 20th century CEOs are contacting 20th century software developers to develop 20th century solutions to 21st century mm. problems. And... <clears throat> Um, so yeah, like I don't think that anyone who accurately understands the landscape of artificial intelligence could exist inside of Cruz and Waymo and think that the Cruz and Waymo approach are going to be successful where the Tesla approach fails. But but what what do you think what do you think their 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 take is though? Do you do you think that Tesla they they think Tesla has the wrong approach. Do you think they truly believe LiDAR is a must? Yeah, I, I think that know, they, but... so safety is one of the things that they care about. Like, I think that they're going to look at those other, the, the FSD approach, the vision only approach and the intelligence approach. And they're going to say, there's no way that you can guarantee this is never going to get into an accident. And I believe that with all my fancy schmancy tools that I can guarantee that a cruise or a Waymo will never get into an accident. And if I can guarantee that, then I'll be successful because that's going to be what the market demands. And the reality of the situation is that that's a false assumption. They can never guarantee they're never going to get into an accident because the real world is complex. Just like the, you know, even though that cruise didn't cause that accident in San Francisco, it was involved and it shows. And, you know, I think a lot of people look at that and they realize something that's very true that these things are not infallible. They're not perfect. And if perfection is your goal and your bar, um, you're just not going to make progress fast enough. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a, an approach that they believe is unbounded and that they're, going for a local maximum that's already, you know, it's really, they're not moving very fast. The local maximum that they're pursuing is not nearly as high as they think it is. And, you know, the other thing is going back to what you said about costs, it's so expensive to pursue the approach yeah. in the way that they're pursuing it, that they're never actually going to be able to create a truly globally scalable solution. Yeah. I, I liked what you said when you're talking about, um, you know, they're, they've already invested They're They've gone down this path uh, of a certain solution. Um, 
you know, I think back to, you know, in high school and in college, I used to, I, I would always do math or physics on computer paper. And the reason I would do it on computer paper is because I didn't want lines or anything because for some reason I, I liked having a clean space to work on. And something that I noticed I was really good at doing that other people for some reason struggled was if, if I was working down something, I couldn't get the right answer. I would just like throw that piece of paper away and start fresh. But other people would sit there and they would erase, and they would erase and all of a sudden the paper is just like all black and it looked like a mess. And I would tell them like, just start all over. Like, like just start, but, but they didn't want to because they already did all this work to get to this point. I'm like, yeah, but you don't know where your mistake was. Your mistake might've been at the very beginning, but you don't know. You're just like erasing, trying to go back and trying to figure mm -hmm. out and you're getting stuck on this one part when it might've been three steps before. And I think that's something companies really struggle to do is to throw everything out and do a complete rewrite. And it's funny because we'll see, I mean, we've seen Elon and Tesla chastise for, for doing rewrites, right? Especially when they say that. And it's just comical to me because you have to do that. You learn a certain amount of things and then you realize we can't go down this path. Okay, well, we've learned a lot. Let's take what we've learned and let's start fresh with this new idea. And let's go from there and let's iterate. And it seems like to your point, well, we've invested all this money in this in this way. We've got this data about this approach. We got to keep going. We're seeing some results. We just have to keep going. And it's that local maximum will will be the death of you. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, yeah. I, I like I like the way you said that because it, it definitely jogged my memory back to to college. I like that example. I wish that I had been more like that because I was definitely more the one that was. I mean math came in a lot of physics stuff came pretty easily to me. So I didn't find myself in too many situations where I was having to redo things. Um, but I do like when you do hit that maximum, what you're capable of, it, it was so hard for me to just be like, crumple that one up, throw it away, start over. Cause that, yeah, like you literally don't know you've got this much work yeah. and you don't know where it is. And if you don't throw it away and redo it, the likelihood is that you're going to be able to find wherever that problem is, is pretty low. Um, yeah, so, it, it yeah. will. It becomes like a word search, right? You know, words, I know what's a word and what's not a word, but to try to find that word in a word search, like I have to search for it. So to find that mistake I made in this math problem or this physics problem is like, all right, well, it's, it's a word search for the mistake and it's better off to start from scratch. And as I go, inevitably you'd be like, Oh, I dropped a negative. Or, you know, like, oh, yeah. I did a square root here for some reason. Or, oh, it's the true vector. Not not the, you know, or, oh, well, I'm solving for velocity instead of acceleration for some reason. Like, I don't know. Like, it's it becomes like these, like, oh, I, this was a stupid mistake. And, yeah. and then you figure out what you did. Yeah. So um, we got about 10 minutes left here. Um, and honestly, I, I really want to to learn more about, about you and yourself and your life. So... You've already alluded that you live uh, in East Texas. Uh, so one, I, I got to know, are you more Houston or more Saints? Like which way are you leaning on that spectrum? And then, yeah, I mean, just I'm curious about where'd you go to school? Why engineering? How'd you get into Tesla? Um, yeah, all that stuff. So I really could care less about most pro sports, um, really any pro sports these days. And so it doesn't like Saints, Houston, Cowboys. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Um, and that's that's heresy for a lot of people around here in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I when I moved here, so I I've been I lived all over the place. So I was born in Colorado. Uh, my parents were missionaries growing up. And so I lived in Africa for five years. I've lived all around the Where? United States. Um, I lived in East Africa for five years. So three years in uh, Tanzania, a year in Kenya, and a year in a little tiny country called Burundi, which most people have never heard of, unless you know that it's right next to Rwanda, which is where the Rwandan genocide occurred in 1995. Okay. I, I spent a lot of time in, uh, in Djibouti. Okay. That's in Djibouti yep. and in Egypt. Yep. Yeah, so a little bit different area of, yeah, a little of bit. Africa. Um, but, you know, I, honestly, there's a lot of Tanzania uh, is probably culturally somewhat similar to areas 
in Egypt, uh, you know, very heavy Islamic influences mm. um, in the large populated areas. So Dar es Salaam, which is the capital of Tanzania, is very much that way. I, I've never really been, so I don't know to either. I've never been to Dar or, um, you know, anywhere in Egypt or, or Djibouti, but I would kind of assume that there's a lot of similarities there. Gotcha. Okay. So, so you lived in Djibouti or Djibouti in Africa for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you guys came back to the States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we lived in Africa from 1995 until 2000. Um, oh, wow. And then so like, I was, I was real young. Yeah. yeah. But, but not, not that young. I mean, you were still like, that's, that's an age where you still remember it. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I was, a, I think I turned eight right after we moved there. And then we moved back when I was 13. So definitely formative, like a lot of my, yeah, yeah. I remember all the time that we spent there, um, very shaped by those experiences. And um, I was homeschooled pretty much throughout that entire time. When we came back, I went to a public high school in Southern Oregon, which is in the middle of nowhere. Like my graduating class was 40 people. So tiny little school um, and got a lot of opportunity. Oh, huge culture shock. And I was I was the most clueless social person at the high school for basically the entire time I was there. It was like looking back on it, it's hilarious to remember situations be like, I just didn't understand what was going on around me at all. And I was like, you know, people were all in on what was going on and I was not. So yeah, that, from, that was from the style, the clothes, the the music, the slang, all of it, right? It was... Yeah, and and then how to like pick up on social cues of what's cool, what's not cool, mm -hmm. like what you know, being engaged in a conversation and not knowing where the boundaries of the conversation were supposed to be, and people are like, "You're such an idiot," and like not even picking up, like they're basically telling me to shut up, and I'm not shutting up, and <laughs> all kinds of fun stuff. Okay. So, so, so you, you go to high school there. Um, and then, so I always then wanted we'll... to fly, uh, for the air force growing up. And so I had managed to actually get an appointment to West point. Um, but unfortunately I had a concussion in my, the last semester of, uh, senior year of high school playing baseball. Um... And so I knew that I would have had to report directly to West point, like pretty much right after um i went to or right after i graduated you know they you have to report way early in the summer um and i knew that it wasn't going to be enough time to heal and so i switched over um and i really wanted to fly anyway so it was kind of a couple things together that pushed me towards the air force and i didn't have good enough vision to get into the air force academy um, but i accepted an rotc scholarship to embry riddle in Arizona, which graduates the second most number of Air Force pilots behind the Air Force Academy. And I was wow. on a full scholarship there. Um, and then after my first semester there was done, they, the Department of Defense Medical Review Board um, medically disqualified me from service in the armed forces for five years after the concussion. And we didn't know that that was going to be the case initially. Um, so it was kind of like a rug pull on that whole goal, but that's where I started out. And that's how I got into engineering. I really wanted to fly, but the ticket to the ROTC scholarship was an aerospace engineering degree. And so that's mm -hmm. what I was majoring in there and I ended up transferring uh, to a school here in East Texas called Laterno University, which is another good engineering school, private university. And, um, they didn't really have a good aerospace program here. So I ended up in mechanical engineering instead of aerospace, but that was how I ended up in that field. And, but never was really passionate about becoming an engineer. What I want to do is fly. And so kind of meandered away from engineering into more business and other, other related areas after that. Wow. Well, I mean, talk about resiliency. I mean, that's, that's a heck of a story right there. I mean, and, and seriously, shout out for getting nomination to to West Point. I mean, for for those who don't know, that's a that's a really big deal, right? There's only a certain amount of people who get nominated to each of the service academies. There's only five service academies, really, as far as nominations for, because Coast Guard doesn't require a nomination. And 
only a certain amount, you know, per congressman. It's a whole thing. You have to go, you have to interview, and they have it was to quite the be, process. Your, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, I actually well, went honestly, to the um, you know, the fact that I was at this tiny little school in Southern Oregon really played in my favor. If I had lived in a place like Dallas or you know any of these huge populated. Yeah places it would have been a lot harder i probably would not have been able to to make it through but it was a huge part of my life you know all through high school like i knew that was the reason that i went to public high school in the first place instead of continuing to be homeschooled is because mm. we wanted all of the extracurriculars all the activities all the resume stuff um so i was doing yeah everything all the time in high school and holding myself to a very high standard to try and, and make it like, it's basically like trying to get into Harvard, except harder. Yeah. Yeah. The, the academies actually have a lower acceptance rate. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's not something that you just decide your junior year you want to go do, right? Like you, you have to, yeah. You know, and, and there's a physical fitness assessment, assessment test to do with all it. Yeah. I, yep. I, I remember going through the process. It was, uh, it wasn't fun. And you know, people were like, like, why are you even thinking about this? Like who are not even like, taking the SATs yet like and you're worried about this I'm like oh I got to do it yeah but uh okay so so you became a mechanical electrical or a mechanical engineer I'm talking about my own background mm -hmm. now <laughs> mechanical engineer and then you you decided eh I want to go into business and so uh you know I stalked your LinkedIn a little bit um you've been working for yourself for a while now it seems or you're a co-owner maybe is mm -hmm. what I saw yeah. So different things. I I've done some stuff with my father-in-law, um, for a long time. And that was, yeah, a business that we did wholesaling. And so, uh, I have a background now in a lot of logistics stuff and wholesale economics. And, um, it's also a small biz business. And so, you know, wearing all the hats, doing all the it work, like, mm -hmm filling all the holes and all the gaps. Um, I did that for uh, quite a number of years, I guess from 20, must have been 2014 until 2019. Uh, so about five years. And then um, from there, I actually managed a regional cleaning company that we did about a million in annual revenue and managed a team of like 45 people wow. all throughout the pandemic cleaning which was, yeah, that was fun. Um, <laughs> so yeah, those are, those are the main things that I've done in business. And then, um, from there just here recently been getting more into trying to go out on my own and get into content. I, there's a, a line that, um, Naval has in his, in the, well, it's Naval said it, but the, it was compiled by someone else in the almanac of Naval Ravikant where he talks about management of humans is the oldest and most difficult form of leverage. And I've experienced that very viscerally. <laughs> and I'm like, I think I'm going to focus on media and code as forms of leverage moving forward. And I'm going to leave management to other people who like it more than I do. Yeah. They don't push back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's easy. So, so, so what are you doing now or, or what can you talk about at least about what you're doing now? Yeah. So, um, I've been going through Alex Finn who goes by NFT God on Twitter. He's got a course on X growth. I've really been wanting to get into content creation, but I've been just working through like finding my voice. I kind of arrived to having a YouTube channel and a presence on Twitter through Farzad, which is just kind of like a, a weird um, providential thing. And so that's what most people talk to me about, what most people have heard me talk about. But honestly, that's a very small portion of the overall things that I want to talk about. Um, and so I've been working on like, okay, how do I define what it is that I want to talk about? Um, and I'm probably will not build a, an audience from scratch, but will change, you know, who's, who's my target audience. And so actually just here over the past month, I've started to narrow in on that a lot better, um, doing a lot of backend work and decided that the, the niche that I really want to focus on is the intersection of personal growth, social responsibility, and then technology. And I think a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today really 
talks about a lot of that stuff. And so, you know, Tesla is obviously one of those things in the technological space that's going to affect uh, not only the landscape of technology and, and society, um, but the, well, yeah, the landscape of technology, but also socially, like whatever happens with artificial intelligence, whatever happens with the bot, that's going to impact a lot of social structures. And so thinking about how those things are going to change. Um, and so I want to actually create content on that both. I love long form podcasts. Same. I love writing. And um, so, you know, video and written content that's focused on long conversations kind of at, in that area. And um, I'd also like to increasingly have, I've had a few conversations with small business people, well, and especially with my background in small business, um, that I feel like I have an interesting perspective to add for people in the startup space or the small business space. Um, and so I'd like to include a little bit of consulting if possible. This is really something that it's going to just be a work in progress. I'll have to figure out if it works or it doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to have that be a way for me to interact with people who are dealing with problems in the real world instead of just thinking about problems and, you know, analyzing things from a completely third party perspective. Um, so to be able to have conversations and hopefully give some valuable advice to people um, who are, you know, on the ground in real time, trying to figure stuff out, help them to be able to both zoom out to the macro mm. um, and then zoom into their problems um, and give a third party perspective. That's a little bit different than anyone who's an investor or, um, you know, a stakeholder, a board member might give them um, just in, in conversations and use that as a way to add value to real things and also to, to battle test ideas. Wow. Hans, you, I feel like, uh, I could talk to you for, for hours. I mean, there, there's so much there to, to unpack. I, I, I feel like I resonate with, with a lot of what you're saying there. Uh, I mean, it was kind of the impetus behind me starting this channel was, I just, I just want to talk. I just want to talk about what was on my mind. Not like, I don't consider myself a, a Tesla channel. I mean, Tesla is, you know, I'm an all investor in Tesla. So that's on my mind a lot, but I tend to go in and out of things. I love talking about health and fitness. I like to talk about politics in a non left or right view. I, I like to talk about, you know, just everything, you know, it's, it's, I don't know. I, to me, it's like the human condition. Mm -hmm the idea of making this podcast is just to talk about things and just see where the conversations go. That's why I, I don't like to script things. I like to just go off the cuff, you know, just see where the conversations go organically. And, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to have to have you back on or, or maybe we can do something um, uh, on your channel, but it's been. We hard. should do both. We, I can come back and then, yeah, I'd like to have you on as well. And we can kind of have the, the mirror image conversation of this one um but yeah i think that we've lost in the pat like it goes back to a structural thing that until the ability to have these types of long-form conversation i think that podcasts specifically are a counterforce against a technological trend that started with tv that really fragmented our ability to have conversations and to think yeah. And so I think podcasts and long form conversations are moved back towards actual critical thinking and there are moved back towards, you know, like people used to interact with information primarily through books and pamphlets in a completely different way of interacting with information. And it forms a completely different worldview than a TikTok worldview. And, exactly. you know, I think that that is something that's dramatically needed. And so that's why I love having these types of conversations and, you know, want to continue to promote this as something that is far superior and far more valuable to society than all of the ephemeral crap that we typically deal with. So yeah, it's fun. I love it. I love it, man. All right, everybody go follow uh, Hans C. Nelson on, on X. Uh, you've seen him with Farzad and, you know, a lot of the Tesla stuff, but clearly, very clearly, that's just scratching the surface. So we'll definitely have to get a lot deeper, but 
we're gonna leave it there hans thanks again for for joining me on this and uh i guess we'll see you guys all later peace